Welcome to Echoing Faith Today, a podcast conversation on themes of impact and relevance in the new directory for catechesis from the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization. I'm Dr. Jem Sullivan, host and faculty in the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America. On this podcast, we'll hear from scholars, experts, and those in pastoral ministry. So welcome back, and thank you for taking your place at this table of conversation. I'm pleased today to welcome Margaret Matiasevich, Executive Director of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, or NCCL as it's known. NCCL is a national organization that exists to promote the ministries of catechesis and evangelization within the church's teaching mission. It provides support to catechetical leaders and catechists in their service to the church in the United States. Previously, Margaret worked in parish and diocesan roles in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and her work has focused on catechetical leadership through collaboration and the utilization of technology to spread the gospel. Margaret, it's great to have you on the podcast. I have busy days, so I really appreciate your time uh, to join us in this podcast conversation and welcome. Thank you, Jen, so much for inviting me on behalf of the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership. I'm grateful to be here. So this long awaited directory for catechesis is the third of its kind since the Second Vatican Council. What is the significance of this directory for catechetical leaders and catechists in the United States? Well, Jim, I think there's so many layers of significance to this particular document. Um, first of all, we have been anticipating its arrival for at least three years. And so the catechetical community in that time has been able to identify a deep hunger within itself, you know, that we've wanted to respond to our vocation of catechesis and evangelization in new and diverse ways. And so in this anticipation, we've identified that deep hunger within us to try something new. So it's almost like we've had this prolonged advent, you know, waiting and hope for the potential of this document. Um, but all that being said, I don't think any of us anticipated it to drop amidst a pandemic. You know, so a time where the church has been grappling with deep and challenging questions of how to exist and grow um, more deeply into its mission under these circumstances. And so to have this catechetical document manifest at this time is, is really an amazing opportunity. It's like divine intervention of inspiration and hope. Um, I think it gives us an opportunity as a church to collaborate through prayer and inspiration, you know, offered really diversely in all the different chapters. Um, we have new opportunities to reflect upon how do we do what we do um, and do it more effectively, especially, like I'm saying, in these circumstances of pandemic and really opportunity for, for new life. So I think it's empowered us, you know, um, because the invitations of the document and the different chapters is all about new methods, um, really getting to the heart of catechesis and evangelization. And so I think it's now an opportunity for us to take a communal responsibility um, to accompany others in their journey of faith in these circumstances. And I think this document gives us, I guess, just that communal opportunity to focus on something in particular to, to achieve that. Um, so it's really exciting for us. Uh, thank you for asking. You know, and that's so well said in terms of the anticipation, right? We've just been waiting uh, and it was supposed to come last year, but this is in fact, as you pointed out so well, this is perhaps the right moment, the opportune moment, given all of the challenges. Now, from your perspective as executive director of the National Conference of Catechetical Leadership, what themes in the directory stand out as particularly important? I know there's so many of them, there but so can you identify a couple of themes that are particularly important for discussion and reflection today? Sure, um, I think one of the, the main highlights that I see is really to recognize that the tasks of catechesis actually have been slightly adjusted. Um, not only do we have now five tasks versus the six, um, but the way that the document nuances the original task, but kind of gives them a whole new level of meaning and depth. Um, I think it's a really interesting opportunity for catechists to explore that. You know, I would encourage them to, to look at these tasks alongside the national directory and kind of look at the parallels and look at the differences that we see. 
um, for me, I found something as simple as the wording um, really an opportunity for conversion because it, it presumes a relational model of catechesis where the prior tasks more kind of define the tasks of catechesis. Even though it's always been in the context of the catechumenal model, which is relational, there's something about how the differentiating of the tasks in this document are really inspiring to bring that really out. Um, but also that task that we see that's kind of missing um, is throughout the whole document. So this missionary task of catechesis um, has disappeared from the list of tasks, but it's actually integrated into really what I want to say as the character of catechesis. So from the get-go of this document, you'll see that missionary layers are built into how we are supposed to function as a catechetical community. So essentially, it's this calling us out of our comfort zone, calling us, I, I love this descriptor it had in the, one of the first chapters of, of going to the core of culture and from there illuminating the gospel. I think, wow, what, that's an amazing shift in how we understand catechesis and its nature. Um, so I think that that's a really exciting component of, of the document. Um, I also found the theme of communal responsibility really illuminating and empowering. You know, I've worked in the field of catechesis for almost 20 years, you know, and there's a tendency to kind of isolate catechesis here and evangelization, evangelization there and vice versa, and then all the other ministries that we do in their own little boxes. But what this does is really transform that concept in the sense of it identifies the whole of the community as responsible for formation and catechesis. And it kind of blows up our tendency to just put it in this little box. Um, but also what I found inspiring about that is really then as catechists, our responsibility is to empower the faithful to be formers of faith, that their whole life can be actually a catechetical moment, right? How I engage in my community, how I you know, engage in my household, the decisions I make, those are all opportunities to invite people into a deeper understanding of Christ. And so I really loved how it opened up the responsibility piece and really looks at a lot of different roles in an intimate way. So um, that's kind of a nice component, but really that sense of this is the role of the whole of the lay faithful, or not the lay faithful, the faithful period. Um, and that really is transformative then for, in my opinion, of how we view catechesis. It's not something that's just one budget line or one program or one person's role, but it's all of our responsibility as a community. So those were a couple of themes that I found, found very fascinating and inspiring and empowering. You know, and I have to say, as I hear you talk, those were the ones that also jumped out at me because the first one is in terms of the tasks of catechesis, that is so powerful to say, you know, this is taking really Pope Francis's words, I am a mission uh, and saying, you know, now the church is in a permanent state of mission. And so, everything that is done, evangelization, catechesis, all of the catechetical moments are now infused with this missionary outreach so that people can somehow encounter the Lord Jesus in an, all of these activities. So very, very uh, true. And also the sense of the community. I mean, I remember the general directory for catechesis, the last one, uh, was talking about the parish as a living catechesis. It's not simply the place where catechesis takes place, but it's actually the a living catechesis itself. So that goes very well to your point. The document offers both continuity and innovation. Mm -hmm. Among the new themes uh, presented is the phenomenon of digital culture and the globalization of culture. How has NCCL responded already to these new cultural contexts that are shaping catechesis today? Thanks for asking, Jim. You know, I think this is kind of a, almost a point of tension for the church, you know, from a variety of standpoints. You know, we have a little bit of hesitancy to truly embrace the digital realm and, and accept the concept of globalization as far as how we do what we do. Um, so it brushes up against some of our decision making, I think, as church and how we are organized. Um, but I think there's an opportunity for us here to think bigger and more collaborative um, and think about the potential of how far our reach can be if we're thinking broader as community. Um, so I think NCCL definitely over its history has been an advocate for trying new methods and exploring um, new ways of coming into relationship with others in the context of faith. Um, we've definitely been an advocate for promoting um, digital methodologies for curriculum. Um, 
But I would say um, in recent history, we actually have had to address that head on. Um, culturally, we've been accepting of this idea, well, we're not really willing to explore the digital realm fully. Um, but come this pandemic in May, we've had to completely transform our cultural tendency as an organization and offered a virtual event um, for two weeks um, using different opportunities for formation and networking. And really it became this opportunity to introduce our members through accompaniment of how to do this, how to explore this model of formation and exploration. Um, and we were really successful and it was it was extremely exciting to see um so i think you know we're embracing it but we're moving on the fast track now jim because it's actually going to impact a lot of how we function as a community um like most churches i think we're we're all challenged with how do we um, live in the pandemic and embrace this digital concept um and you know this globalization reality right that we're all um living uh, so I think that NCCL will actually in the next, you know, couple months really be exploring some significant changes. Um, we'll also be hosting an event called Magnify to look at the directory intimately over four months um, to give our people time to process. And really we're hoping offer a model of how to do this. You know, it's not instant, it's not just information, but it's processing, it's understanding and translating that into a digital world. So um, it's been exciting, but certainly fast-tracked when, as a, I think as a church culture, it's been kind of a, a hesitant area for us to explore in its fullness. So we're kind of holding that tension. Does that make sense, Jen? Yes, it absolutely does. You know, you mentioned accompaniment, so I want to just uh, talk about how the new directory gives priority to the identity and formation of catechists by placing these themes in chapters three and four of part one. Uh, so right there in the first part, catechist formation is to do with being, it says, before doing. Very interesting, being a catechist before doing, and then knowing how to be with those uh, who are being catechized. Uh, the catechist, the director says, is formed to become a witness of faith and a keeper of the memory of God. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on that description of the role of the catechist? Yeah, thank you, Jen. That's been actually a really powerful part of this document. Um, again, you know, being someone that's been in the catechetical realm for quite some time, I've seen different models of doing catechist formation. And sometimes we want to simplify it to covering a certain amount of content, having a certain knowledge of the faith so that you can transmit it. Um, but really, I appreciate how this document is saying that it's really about the character, caricature, caricature of the person, right? The ability to be in relationship with another. Before you can be, act as a catechist, it says you have to be a catechist. Um, and that is so true as to what um, I've been trying to impart as a master catechist for years, you know, that it's more than just, I attended these courses. It's about actually being, being able to connect faith with life and not just your own story, but being able to pull that out of another person's life journey and their story. I think that um, the document does say something along the lines of, you know, the church is the, the, a journey of people, or people all on a journey of faith, excuse me, a people on a journey of faith at a certain time in history. And that's exactly what I think that this component of catechetical formation that the document highlights is trying to pull out that really each individual has their own particular experience of God's revelation and in a, a unique way that tells a larger journey of faith of the communal people, you know? Um, so I think to form catechists with that dimension of being able to listen, accompany, um, reflect back what's being told in a way that they understand that this is God and Christ present in their life I think that that's an amazing accentuated piece in this um, formational component. Um, because after you understand those pieces of relationship, only then can you know the transmission of the knowledge of faith and even the fullness of prayer and liturgy, right? Only then can all of that take a deeper root in one's life. So I, I really love that part of the document and I'm glad you're bringing it out because I think we have a lot of work to do there because um, it's a different timeline than just checking off boxes. It's really accompanying catechists too in becoming more fully the depths of the catechists that they are. Does that make That's sense? 
Yeah, that's really well said. And it seems to me that there is, you're right, that there's a lot of work to do here because I think we've been so used to looking at catechist formation um, as sort of check the box, but I've got this content to cover. But in fact, it is turning, uh, becoming a, a person who can be in relationship with others uh, as they journey in their relationship to God, uh, to Jesus, to, to, uh, to in, within the community of the church. So it's that very important of being formed as a person who is in relationship. I was going to say, Jem, too, I think with the current circumstances we're in, that's, that's part of the, the tension because we're used to programming, we're used to calendaring, we're used to um, offering a catechetical experience in a certain model. And this is really challenging us that the relationship component is primary. So how does that affect our decision making as we're trying to explore these new models? You know, how is relationship being built in the digital space? How are we um, rethinking our programs in such a way that's focusing on the person and that encounter um, versus okay, I got to check off this rehearsal or this component of the curriculum. So it will be exciting to see. And I think the spirit is definitely at work. <laughs> That's great. You know, so just along those same lines, then, you know, in your work at NCCL, uh, your leadership role, you speak with catechetical leaders at the diocesan level, at catechists around the country uh, every day. In light of the new directory, what are your hopes for leaders and catechists who are really struggling through the effects of the pandemic on their ministry? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a little line in the directory that I like the language. It says, you know, it's time to like enliven with boldness and creativity, both the culture and religious landscape and the personal horizon of every human being. I think that's just so beautifully expressed that there's a time to be bold and creative. And I, I think that that's now. And it's not just in the religious community, but in the culture at large. And really that is a requirement to touch the deep personal depths of each person. Um, because only then do we have this transformative um, life-giving experience. And I think, you know, because we're, we're really challenged by navigating these circumstances and understanding how to do what we've traditionally done and kind of make it work in these changing realities almost week to week, depending on where we're located. I think that this speaks to that potential. You know, it's just about being bold and creative, but always being in touch with that depths of every person um, and those in our community. So I think, you know, some basic inspiration, I think, is that it's a time to collaborate with a wide variety of people. No, uh, kind of going back to that responsibility of the whole of the faithful. If we collaborate with a variety of people, it's an opportunity for us to really implement some really strategic and envisioning, like, enlivening experiences, you know, that um, might not look like anything we've done before, but we have to be kind of a bit vulnerable, you know, um, a bit open to saying, I don't know how to do this, but I would like somebody from the community to help me understand and, and really being open to the work of the people creating something new and dynamic. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to use the essence of this document to call that forth out of the community. Um, and I, I couldn't help but be reminded of you know, the first uh, apostles being sent out and, you know, Pentecost and, and <laughs> not trusting that they could speak new languages, you know, but suddenly they are given the gifts and they are able to do things they had never imagined themselves being capable of doing. I think that this is one of those moments for us, you know, is trusting in the idea and in the experience that we know in our faith that God provides us that capacity of speaking in new ways. Um, and the methods will present themselves probably beyond our wildest imaginations. But if we're open and we're vulnerable to naming that um, and putting that out in prayer and putting that out to the community, I think we have an opportunity um, to discover something new. So my hope is that we're bold and uh, innovative and creative and just trust in that process. Um, I don't know where it'll take us though, Jim, but I'm excited to see and, and hopeful for any collaboration that NCCL can offer along the way. And that's great. And are there any other themes, Margaret, that you wish to highlight in the Directory for Catechesis? Yeah, I, I, I just wanna pull out, um, I think two in particular, but um, starting with the prioritization of diverse peoples as essentially, um, uh, they're, they're essential folks to minister to. You know, so there was the mentioning of persons with disabilities, 
is immigrants and migrants, people on the margins and prisons, those that have been trafficked. I mean, there's really a, a demand, right, um, put on the people of faith that it is our responsibility to accompany people in all of these different walks of life. It's not only our responsibility to serve those that are showing up in our parish community. I mean, that's how I hear this. I hear this as a, a, a really forceful spirit um, demand, you know, that we, we're not doing enough if we're only serving those that show up. We have to go reach those that are hungering um, and that need um, a relationship with Christ and accompaniment. So I think that that was um, a really insightful piece because that's gonna challenge our traditional programming models. You know, it's not a one size fits all program. You know, it's really, or you know, we're offering this class and that's it. No, this really requires an extensive and ongoing commitment of the community of faith, you know, um, and really recognizing and identifying the needs out in the world um, and going out to um, assure that catech catechesis and formation um, is happening. I'm also inspired by some of the, the practical components as well, Jim, you know, um, the engagement of the sciences with memory and with space. Um, as I think that identifying all of those factors and some of those multi-dimensional facets, I would say, of, of what catechesis and evangelization is, it really uplifts the vocation. I think, you know, often we can minimize it to just one kind of maybe an elementary program in a parish, um, but that's not at the heart of what catechesis and evangelization is, and it's one component. But I love that this document uplifts all the diverse elements that make formation happen in its comprehensive capacity. Um, so I think, I think that exposure, one, is going to be really affirming to the catechetical community, but also it, I think, would enliven the, faith, the larger faithful community to say, wow, I really have a responsibility here to contribute in all these ways. Or even if I am contributing to recognize that as formation, you know, like hospitality is formation or, um, you know, the different sacramental preparations or um, what's happening in administration in your parish, all of that forms a community and a particular understanding of why we do what we do as a Catholic community. So I really like that it offers those different dimensions and really uplifts that diverse capacity of, of what we do. I cannot thank you enough uh, for joining us today. This must be a busy time as NCCL continues to plan its fall activities. So I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you once again and blessings on your work. Thank you, Jim, so much. It's been wonderful collaborating with you, and I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of this, as the whole of NCCL is. Um, so thank you for your leadership. You're welcome. I hope you found this conversation informative. Stay tuned as we continue this podcast series on key themes in the directory for catechesis. Till next time, keep the faith and keep echoing faith. I'm Dr. Jem Sullivan, and thank you for joining me today.